Started this morning, starting off singing this song. Can you believe? Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Save me. Save me.
Let's give God praise this morning. And then we're going to slow it down. As we sing this song, we'll come to the altar. surrender.
everlasting joy. Come on, church, lift your hands, lift your voice, singing it out. And I of new love. Oh, sing it out and out. house of God this morning. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's go before God. If you're new in this place, on the back counter, we always have this prayer request sheet. If you have any needs that you want stated across this pulpit, amen, please write them down so that we can come together and pray for them. Hallelujah. For salvation, let's pray for Angel, Kimmy, James and Susan Coffee, Bailey Coffee, Jeff and Christy Coffee, uh, Kaylee Jackson, TJ Jackson, Cody, amen, and just believing God for them to come to know Jesus Christ as we do. For healing, since we believe in a miracle healing working God, amen. Let's pray for Sister Deborah, Sister Beth, Sister Lorraine, uh, Bailey Coffee, uh, Todd Cook, Abby, Jeff and Christy Coffee, Rolanda Hill, uh, Crystal, uh, June Simpson. Michael, Mary, uh, Victor, Delphina and Jesse, uh, Christy, Sequita Smith, Angel, and also for Lisa, uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer, and so let's believe God, amen, for her, that's somebody's co-worker in this place, special request, let's also pray for Brother uh, Frank and Sister Donna, Leslie Molina, Joe and Brenda, Ashley, Dwayne Dobbs, Jesse and Christy, um, Bianca and Ethan, Monique and Jesse and family, Ashley and Armando and family, Castro family, uh, myself and my family, Diane and Incencio, Jamie and Nicole, the Carrizo family, and also for Sister Sequita Smith, amen, also has a special need, hallelujah. Let's be praying, amen, also for our mother church on the south side, for our baby sister church also in Yukon. Let's contend for God to move in this place and in our community, praying for all the upcoming events, the outreaches and different things that we have going on. And then last but not least, amen, if you have a need heavy upon your heart that's not been stated, just show that by uplifting of your hand this morning, amen, as we contend together, coming together as a body of Christ. Let's go before God this morning and then as prayer subsides of Kyrie, Amen. Can open us up in prayer. So let's pray this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, help us, Father. Give your favor to come upon us. Lord, we come before you, my God, so grateful and thankful to be able to come into your house and worship your holy name and honor you, God. Lord, we are needing your help, my God. Lord, we are asking, Lord, for your work to be done, Lord, that we would conform to yours, God. Lord, we are asking, Lord, for transformation in people's lives, my God. Lord, you're speaking the supernatural, my God. Healing, my God. Lord, 
broken bondages, broken addictions, broken down. Lord, we just love you. We praise your name. Amen. Take a few moments to greet one another. Hallelujah. Oh my. Everything is working together, blessing me. All things are working. All things are working together. Searching my heart so that I can receive the losses in my life, pay for the lessons. To be defeated, I stood my ground and then I found that you were standing there with me through all things. All things are working together, working together, blessing me to be closer to you. Cause you satisfy my soul, God, and that's the blessing. Amen. Everybody has their seats. Glory. Hallelujah. I'd like to w welcome everybody to the Door Church where Jesus Christ is still changing lives. Amen. Uh, we do have a few announcements. The calendar is on the back counter. Uh, I know we only have about a week and a half left. But amen. Be, uh, be mindful of what is going on. Let's not forget tonight we have prayer at 6. I mean not 6, but prayer at 5, service at 6. Amen. For our evening service. And those that are new, amen. It's a completely... Separate and different service, amen. So like I said, most churches around here, they have one, two, three services, but usually it's all the same thing, just maybe different song service and stuff like that, but it's completely different service and sermon, hallelujah. Um, and then our mother church is starting revival this week, starting today, going on through Thursday. And so if you're able to make it, I encourage you, uh, Pastor Adam Saavedra is one of my family is actually one of our favorite uh, preachers, and he's preaching on the end times. Amen. And so Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, we'll, we'll, we will be going to support our mother church and partake of that. But we will have service here Wednesday night, amen, continuing our lessons from the body, which is our uh, Bible study and service uh, in the midweek. Hallelujah. So be inviting people to that. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, Tulsa is having a revival as well. I know it's about an hour and a half to hour, 45 minutes away, but if you're able to make it, I would encourage you to go support Pastor Randy Graham and his wife, Phaedra. Uh, but we will be having outreach Saturday morning at 11 a.m. We will be getting our flyers for our revival in May, 
by this Wednesday. And so we can start passing those out, contending for God, what God wants to do in our revival as well. Um, and then uh, Monday, the 29th, we have our Hour of Power, which is our monthly prayer meeting. Amen. And so partake of that. Be a part of that. Amen. And then all the other announcements, things coming up in May. We got our revival. We got the Mother's Day lunch, women's gathering. So just look at that on the bottom corner. Uh, left corner of the calendar, take one with you. If there's only one left, take it anyway, and we'll print some more. Amen. Hallelujah. That's all the announcements this morning. I'm going to take up the offering. Hallelujah. I have no idea what the heck that is doing. Let's give this morning, amen. We just came back from conference in Grants, New Mexico, and it was much needed. Uh, so grateful and thankful we got back, amen, Saturday night. Uh, we took our time coming back. It's only like an eight-hour drive, but we got back about 10 p.m. And uh, just grateful for what God is doing, amen. That church is uh, in Grants, New Mexico. That's my hometown. I was born and raised in Grants, New Mexico. I left there when I was 18 uh, to come here for school and just God's will. And uh, that church is still going strong. It's, it's a blessing to go back and see uh, people that have been, I mean, my, my children's church leader is still going there. Uh, he's a lot older, a lot more gray hairs, and probably half of them are mine, amen, just the <laughs> stresses of life uh, that I brought, amen, but uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to see, amen, faithful men and women to continually uh, serve God and be there and do what God has called them to do. And, you know, as we went back to conference, they're able to see fruit of their labors or fruit of their even their giving. You know, that's why it's called the Harvester's Homecoming because the baby churches are coming back, amen, to the, well, which would, for us would be our great-grandmother church. And they could just see the fruit, amen, of lives being changed and transformed, of them continuing giving year after year, service after service, and just as I look out, amen, even to, this, to, the, to the congregation, that's a blessing that you need to look to your left, to your right, in front of you, behind you. Because if you've given to God in the offering before in this church, this is part of your fruit. Because your giving allows for the doors to stay open, allows for us to keep doing things that we need to do, concerts, buying the flyers for the revival, all those things for more people to come in. And so your giving, amen, extends that out, hallelujah. So I just encourage you, amen, to give this morning. Pray about it. Like I always say, pray about it. Seek God, and he'll, if, he'll tell you what to give, how much to give. And even if it's sacrificially, and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to pay whatever. God's telling me to give this amount. He's going to provide. Can you say amen? So let's give this morning as Brother Joe comes and prays for the offering. Amen. Believe what the Lord has done in me. musician you're dismissed and then so is uh, Sunday school uh, ages 5 to 11 amen uh, for Sunday school you'll follow 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 sister summer amen <laughs> follow amen we had a glorious time in conference and 
maybe this evening I'll have um, people testify about it. But we got challenged, amen, and actually I'm going to bring the challenge uh, at the end of my sermon. So if you turn in your Bible to Acts 1, 12 through 14. I believe if you need a Bible, most people have their phone and you got apps now if you want to use your phone and the app. Or there's Bibles on the back counter if you'd like to have something, a physical book in your hand, amen. To grow in your spiritual relationship in Christ, you need to associate or go to with a, uh, associate with a solid, healthy church. How can you identify a healthy church? One of the best ways to find one, or one of the best ways is to find one that is firmly planted in prayer. This is a critical indicator of a healthy church. Because the Christian church actually began with and through a prayer meeting. So let's read our text this morning, Acts 1, 12 through 14. And it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount call, uh, called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all his brothers. So around this time, you know, Jesus had died, resurrected, and then right before this he ascended and he told the church, he told his disciples to, to stay and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And then they came together, and this is where this text comes from, is that they came all together in one accord in prayer and supplication. See, after Christ's resurrection, he spent 40 days with the disciples explaining the mission of the church and what it should be. Before he ascended to heaven, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and wait in the upper room. This is where we know the day of Pentecost, the upper room. They were in the upper room for 10 days. In a 10-day prayer meeting, asking for God's guidance and waiting for God to lead them. Could you imagine nowadays if I called a 10-day prayer meeting? I, I would kind of question, I wonder how many people would show up. God responded powerfully with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The church originally or actually originated from a prayer meeting waiting on God. This is where they were established as what we call the first church. Throughout scripture, we see that Jesus was quite clear that his house was to be a house of prayer. Throughout his mission on earth, Jesus regularly immersed himself with prayer, setting the example for his followers. Jesus taught us how to pray. I mean, there's even stories that, you know, there's times where Jesus set aside and even asked the disciples to pray with him, and he would go off a little bit by himself and then come back, and he's like, he's seeing the disciples asleep and even asked them, can you not pray with me for one hour? And to clarify just one thing, like, uh, Pastor Tom Payne, he's a leader of our branch region. And uh, you know how we say a uh, prayer hour before. And so some people think, and they're like, man, you got to pray for a whole hour before service. And it's actually not that way. It's just the time frame. You know, service starts at 6 or like to this morning, service starts at 1030, prayer at 930. We don't pray for the whole hour. We pray for about 30 minutes. And then we kind of what we call like the inter hour is where we kind of fellowship before service. And if you see song service up here, they're kind of getting things ready, getting things ready for song service, trying to practice some of the songs or maybe get some of the iron, some of the little things out. But it's not a full hour. And so maybe that will help uh, encourage you to come because sometimes you're deterred. It's like, man, I don't know what to pray for for, thir for an hour. But prayer is important. 
in God's church, Jesus' church, the Christian church was founded on prayer. So you can find a healthy church by seeing how they follow the example of Jesus Christ. A starting point of a healthy church always begins with prayer, and that's one of the reasons why we do have prayer before every service. That's one of the reasons why God dealt with me to have a monthly prayer meeting. It's the last Monday of every month. And then, which even what I've been slacking off at times is we do have morning prayer throughout the week. And this is actually going to be part of the challenge at the end of the sermon. But you can see on the calendar that it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Isaiah 56 or actually Matthew 21, 13, just to uh, solidify what I'm saying. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And at this point in time, you know, sometimes one of the things that a lot of people, they always just, they always want just the calm Jesus. They don't think about the, the, the Jesus that got angry. And whip people. This is where this portion of the text come from. They're going into the temple. And on the outskirts, you know, in the the main part, because there was a separation from Gentiles and even the Jews, in this outer court area, they would sell things for sacrifice. Because, you know, back in the the Bible times, you know, uh, before Jesus even was put on the cross, you had to bring animal sacrifice. And so they, in that area, they would be selling and they were doing all these things, just trying to make money. And I mean, can you imagine how it would, would sound with all these animals and you're a Gentile and you're over here trying to pray and, you know, it's like, Jesus, I want you to, you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on? And Jesus was even telling them that needs to be outside the temple. My house needs to be called a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves because, you know, they were probably overcharging. You know, two turtle doves, I don't know how much it cost back then. Let's just say it was two pennies, but this person over here charging $5. That's highway robbery. So the God's house needs to be a house of prayer. This is why we're, even when we say give God praise and worship, that's prayer. This is why it's constant throughout our services because we want to focus on prayer. That is your relationship with God. Isaiah 56, 7 says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's another scripture right there for those that believe only certain races are going to make heaven their home. He says all nations. Every race, every color. And so let's look at how the early church spent their time. Number one is they prayed. I may be preaching to the choir, but I don't, we need to remember this. And actually we were touched Uh, Pastor Tom Payne, the last night of the conference, so eloquently preached this sermon on prayer. And I'm going to actually use some of his notes and some of the notes I got from it at the end of this sermon to really bring in the point. All God's people should be a praying people and give themselves to prayer. In Acts, it was a time of trouble and danger with the disciples of Christ. They had new work before them, a great work in before they went after it, after it, they were instant in prayer to God for his presence with them in it. Before they were first sent forth, Christ spent time in prayer for them. And now they spent time in prayer for themselves. They were waiting for the descent of the Spirit, Holy Spirit upon them. And so they prayed even more. The Spirit descended upon our Savior when he was praying in Luke 3.21. I'm not going to read it, but you can read it for yourself. People are in the best frame to receive spiritual blessings when they are praying. You have the right focus. You're focused upon God. You're focused on the right things. Christ had now promised to send the Holy Ghost 
Now, this promise was not to supersede prayer, but to quicken it and encourage it. See, that's the problem. Sometimes people are like, well, they prayed for the Holy Spirit, and now we need to just focus on the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is supposed to endow it, uh, support it, strengthen it, help you out. When God's will is asked for, for promised mercies, and the nearer the performance seems to be, the more we should be in prayer for it. I mean, think about it. This, this point in time, God has, Jesus has told his disciples the Great Commission. He said, you need to go out into the highways and byways, preach the gospel, teaching all to observe and, 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 and intentionally apply my commandments to their life, baptizing them, raising disciples up to all the nations. And so when you first think about it, if God specifically spoke to you that, wouldn't you be like, man, that's, whew, that's, that's a big undertaking. Well, this is why Jesus says you need the Holy Spirit and you need a prayer. So when you pray, when you got something coming up, when you got anything coming up, we should be in prayer, seeking God. God, what is your direction? God, what is your guidance? God, the, almost the whole conference was talking about wisdom. God, I need your wisdom because you know what? I'm not that smart. I may know some things. I may be smart in some areas, but I'm not smart in all areas. Or even when you're reading the word of God, do you go to God in prayer before you start reading? Because sometimes I've heard it many times, man, I'm reading the Bible, I just don't, I'm not getting it. Well, did you pray before you started? To get that focus, to get that guidance, get that discernment? Acts 2.42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. I could go off on a whole nother sermon on just that portion of the text. Because some people, they'll focus on the in prayers. What about the fellowship? Breaking of bread. Well, I invited nobody to my house, man. I want to clean up after them. Well, then let's go out to eat. Somebody else can clean the dishes. But it says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine which the doctrine was of Jesus Christ and fellowship. So fellowshipping with godly brothers and sisters. We've been kind of saying this portion of the text constantly is iron sharpens iron. What does that mean? We sharpen each other as we fellowship and come together. It's not a bad connotation. It's not talking about uh, getting on each other's nerves, which that will happen, but maybe that's to sharpen you. You, you have a problem with people or you get angry quickly. Well, the only way you're going to get past that is in situations that get you angry so you learn how to manage it. Can you say amen? That's why I say be careful what you pray for. If you ask God for patience, most people think that God, like, you know, he twists the top of your head off and he has this thing called patience and he goes, look, 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 look. that's not how it works. I pray to God it would. But what does he do? He puts you in situations. Oh, my goodness. Your license is expired. So now what you got to do, go to the DMV. And you go to the DMV, and guess what? The line's out to. You're like, oh. And so you got to stand in line for hours on hours. And you're just like, oh, I don't like this. And then God will quicken you and be like, remember, you prayed for patience. So this is also why we need to go in God in prayer. Like, God, like, I bet you that's when you go to God in prayer. You're standing like, like God, help me. I'm about to knock this person out in front of me. <laughs> so go to God in prayer. So my first point was they prayed. And the second one might kind of shock you. This my second point is they continued in prayer. <laughs> they spent much time in it. Over and beyond, more than ordinary, 
prayed frequently and were long in prayer. Like I said, even this prayer meeting, it was 10 days. Some people look at us crazy when we have revival and like all week. Or I don't know if it happened in our church, but you know, before this year, I only had two revivals a year. It is already, it's April, and we've already had two revivals. And we're coming up on a third one. Another one? And guess what? Before every service, there is prayer. See, the reason we do this is we're seeking God. Can can we all say that we need God? Can we say that this nation needs God? That this world needs God? How are we going to touch it? How are we going to bring God to the masses? We're going to need God's guidance and direction. And how do we get that guidance and direction? It's only through prayer. They never missed an hour of prayer. They resolved to persevere. In our text, they they persevered until the Holy Ghost came. How many of us would have stopped short? Like, man, dude. We've been here three days. I don't, I don't think this is going to happen. Or do we believe what God said? We probably had to encourage each other, you know, sharpen each other. We're like, hey, man, this is what Jesus said. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the one that died on the cross and resurrected. Remember that? Remember he, he resurrected from the dead. Remember he was dead, not breathing anymore for three days. And now he's alive. He's the one that said it. Okay, okay, I can go another day. And they persevered until the Holy Spirit came. Luke 24, 52, 53. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. I even had some people freak out because we have three services a week. They would freak out if they were around the disciples. And continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Actually, I, I think even my son just recently told me one of his friends, they're, they're wanting to play a video game or something. They're like, where are you at? You want to play? And he's like, I'm at church. Again? You're at church again. Why? Because we need God. You know, one of the reasons he, he didn't play football this year is because they were treating him wrong because he would leave early on Wednesdays because he's song service leader and needs to get things ready. And because he left early from practice, they said, we're not playing you in the game Friday. Because you went to conference last week and missed half of the week, we're not playing you this week. So he was like, okay, I mean, it doesn't bother me too much. I just won't play. God's more important. They were praising and blessing God. They continued in prayer and supplication. For as praise for the promise is a decent way of begging for the performance, and praise for former mercy of begging further mercy, so in seeking God, we give him the glory of the mercy and grace which we have found in him. How many guys have been bestowed great grace? How many guys have seen God move upon your life? Any little thing that he has given us is worthy of praise. He's given us another day. He's given, actually, uh, you know, in, you, there's so many things that you can look at. We, we don't need to be the pessimist and, you know, looking at the glass only half full. We're like, man, I still have a half cup of water that I can quench my thirst. Or even maybe if the cup is empty, like, oh, man, I'm out. No, you have a cup that you can go and fill. See, there's always a way to look at the, the silver lining, but maybe the reason you don't is because you're not in prayer. You're not allowing God to move. Thirdly, and some of you guys are probably thinking I'm going to say something about prayer. (laughs) They did this in one accord. That's one of the, 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 one of the things that it sometimes, well, 
in looking at it, it is a supernatural thing. How can 120 unique individuals that have different personalities, different mindsets, come together and do something in one accord? It's supernatural. And how they connected was because of prayer. Because they had the right mindset that even though we have differences, the goal was to do the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And guess what? It starts here. It starts in your neighborhood. It starts at your job. They did this in one accord. This imitates that they were together in holy love. That there was no quarrel nor discord among them. I'm not talking about having disagreements. I'm sure they disagreed on things, but they didn't quarrel over it. It didn't cause division. You know, you can be in the congregation and be part of a church, and one of you can like the Dallas Cowboys, and one of you can like the 49ers. It, do, it doesn't have to cause division. Or being in New Mexico or sometimes going to Texas, you know, we're OU, and then they're the Texas Longhorns. That's a, that's a kind of clash, right? But being Christ-like and being a Christian supersedes that. We're like, yeah, you like your team, we like our time. We'll, we'll talk a little smack, but you know what? The main goal is Jesus. It's one accord. See, those who keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace are best prepared to receive the blessings and the comforts of the Holy Spirit. One accord also imitates their worthy concurrence in the supplications that were made. Though one spoke, they all prayed. And if when two agree to ask, it shall be done for them. We, we know the portion of the text that say when two or more are gathered in his name, there I'll be also. That's why I always put an emphasis, uh, uh, emphasis on in his name. Because I've heard a lot of people take it out of context. You know, they'll be somewhere else. And they're like, well, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. And they're like, we're two or more are gathered. But is it in his name? And I always use the exampleship of maybe a party or, you know, a get-together. Or, you know, a lot of people sometimes get together for the Super Bowl. And they have everybody over, you know, and we're going to have a Super Bowl party. You're a Christian, I'm a Christian. But it's not in his name. The focus is different. And see, that's where you got to put the focus back on God. <clears throat> Acts 2, 4, uh, 46 and 47. So continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think this is part of the problem why people are not being added to the church daily is because we're not continuing in one accord. We, we have, I understand we do have our own separate lives. We have our jobs. But can we still have the same one accord mindset that, you know what, I'm at my job because God placed me there. I'm in my neighborhood because God has placed me there. Continually in one accord. That we're not so much trying to get people to come to this church, but we're trying to populate heaven. And when we're trying to populate heaven, guess what? People will be added to the church daily because the focus is upon God. The focus is upon what Christ has done. The focus is in getting people to a place. That's exactly what Jesus done. We're following the exampleship. We're Christians. We're Christ-like. What did Christ do? All that he did was to allow us and make a way for us to be in right standing before God. So therefore, as Christians, we're doing the same thing. And this is where we need prayer the most is we need the guidance so that we can talk to people, understand people, 
or not even just not completely understand them, but knowing that God has the greatest plan in mind for the people that we're talking to. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants it more than we do. So we need to connect with him. Now, once again, I mentioned this in my opening. And I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but the temple was divided into several courtyards. The outermost courtyard was the one designated for the Gentiles. They could not go any further into the temple. So that was their place for prayer. Here, there was the buying and selling, hordes of people talking, and animals all over the place, which made it hard to focus on fellowship with their Heavenly Father. The reason I bring this up is today we face a similar problem in our churches. They have become social centers where we come to catch up on the latest gossip or to be seen by the masses. There's a lot of churches that don't even really have prayer anymore. You just show up, sing some songs, and the person has a message and you leave. There's not even weekly prayer. So when we casually approach worship, we hinder someone else in the process. Do you hear that? When we casually approach worship or even prayer, we can hinder someone else in the process. They are hurt by our gossip or they can't focus on God because of our distraction. And I, you, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I've made the same mistake. There's times I'm sitting in the prayer room and then something comes to mind. I'm like, hey, Andre, remember blah, blah, blah. And they're over talking about it. And then 10 minutes of prayer has gone back, past. I just hindered somebody. Yeah, we may have good conversation, but that's why 30 minutes. And then after, we can fellowship a little bit before. And then especially after service, we can hang around and fellowship. But can prayer be prayer? Now let's take it to the next level towards personal application. Is my body the temple of the Holy Spirit? Everything I do with my body, I do it to God's temple. Am I robbing him or is my body truly a house of prayer? So this is actually a four-point sermon now because I've added some things that Pastor Payne talked about. And maybe I should have grabbed the clip that he played, but his sermon was called Fire for Effect, and that's a military term. It's a military term. And what it stands for is that you unload everything you got. Every missile, every gun, every bullet, every, everything you got to eliminate the enemy. How many guys know we have a real enemy? And it's not your wife. <laughs> it's not your husband. It's not the brother in the church that you dislike. It's not... It's not flesh and blood. We know the scripture says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. Those are usually what influences people. And then we're fighting people instead of the root of the problem. So if, you're, if we are going to survive, if the remnant of the church is going to survive, we need to lock and load. We have an enemy, and either you fight or die. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Now, this portion of the text, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to focus on uh, verse 18. But we know this portion of the text. If anybody's ready, you know it's talking about the armor of God. To put on certain things. But let's read verse 18. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, one thing that Pastor Payne pointed out, which I never saw before, it says all prayer. 
You know what that means? That there's different types. And some of us haven't been using it. We only know of a few. We're only practicing some, but it says all. And one of the things that even stood out to me that I was like, wow, man, that is awesome. Prayer is not listed in the armor because that is where the warfare happens. Prayer is the battlefield. That's why he says put these things on. It's not physically, it's spiritually. Salvation, righteousness, all these things. And then we go in prayer. We get on the battlefield, and some of us are not even on the battlefield. You're kind of on the outskirts. Or maybe you're, you went in the battlefield, but you only had half your armor. What's going to happen? You're going to be taken out. Prayer is the arena, and Christians are failing to realize this. They think their own willpower. Oh, I just got to do more. We need to pray more. That's the more that we need to do. And just to list some of them, I'm not going to list all of them, but there's so many. We know of intercessory prayer. When you're inter I mean, that's what even Jesus is. He's our mediator. He intercessor. Uh, I can't even think of the right word. I was, I'm going to start, start speaking bad English. <laughs> But he comes between, he, he pleads to God for us as an intercessor. And he says, God, this, is, this person has given their life to me. Don't look on their sins, look upon me. See, only through Jesus Christ can we be in right standing with God. He's our intercessor. But can you be an intercessor for other people? One of the greatest intercessors I know are moms. They always pray for their kids. My baby, my son, my daughter. Oh, would you protect them? Many times moms come into me and like, I have this son. I speak to him, but he's not doing right. He's rebelling. Can you pray for him? I'll be praying for them too. That's intercessory prayer. We're trying to plead the blood of Jesus upon their life. That they may, a lot of times it's usually when they're in gangs and different things like that or in prison. Oh, protect them. That's intercessory prayer. There's also supplication. This is just for averting evil, just God helping you. Like, we need that supplication. We need that help. Like, you know, you take supplements as you get older because your body's not producing certain things. Well, suppl supplication prayer is that same thing. You know we don't got it all. We have our failings. We make our mistakes. We're short-sighted sometimes. So we have supplication. God, allow me to see or at least <laughs> have somebody come and tell me. There's also watching, defending. You know, I remember the, the portion of text and then even the song, you know, the, the song I did believe Fred Hammond saying, he's like, Jesus, be a fence. And, and in my, you know, my crazy imagination, I'm like, why a fence? You know, most of the time you can mow through that. Like, why not like a force field or some lasers or, you know, some big old guns or something, missiles? But the thing is, whatever comes from God is supernatural. It's a supernatural fence. It's greater than anything here on earth. There's binding. Bible says whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. You combine certain things. Actually, Pastor Adam Savage in our revival, I uh, believe last year or the year before, was talking about binding things, binding strongholds. Every city that I've been to usually has some kind of stronghold. And we need to connect with God to figure that out so that we can bind it, so that we can replace it with a godly stronghold. Are you praying for those things? Most of the time, we're just praying for our own petitions. God, I need help. God, I need a race. God, I need this. God, I need that. What about for the things of God? God, I want your will to be done. This is where we put God first. 
This is why prayer is so important so that we can change our mindset to the right things. Now this one I got caught up into it and I didn't really write any notes. But this one's going to kind of amaze you guys. Angry prayer. I'm like what? There is a righteous anger that comes from God. Some of us need to get mad at the devil. He's stolen so much from your life. Don't be passive. Oh, that's it. Well. <laughs> Can you get mad? Are you tired of the devil stealing from you? Are we tired of people getting taken out of this church because the devil is picking them off? Can you get angry? Devil, you are a liar. You need to... Kick him out. Give him a black eye. Say, I'm sick and tired of this devil. You have no right. We are children of the king, of the God Almighty. Some of us need to get angry. Well, you know, I'm just passive. I'm a... No. Through Jesus Christ, you can get angry. Sometimes you only get things done when you have a righteous anger. It has to build up in you. It has to boil and unleash it. And see, that's the best way to unleash it is through prayer. Because then you don't unleash it on somebody and then they're just a, a, a bystander and you just unload it on them. And like... But do it through prayer. And then, of course, we have corporate where we come together. We have it before service. We have it once a month. We have it in the mornings during the week. Together with other saints. Now, I've even heard some people, they, well, we're back there praying. Some people are like, well, it's, it's, to them they say it's too distracting, but I think you fail to realize what's happening. You're coming together, and as other people are praying for things, I've learned to tune into that. Not just because I'm, I'm a, uh, what's the word, uh, just trying to overhear and be a busybody. But if you do it in the right spirit, it will remind you of things to pray for. Or you'll see where they're at and see their heart and be like, oh, I didn't know that was going on. I need to pray for them. As they're praying and their, their heart is crying out for certain things or for maybe their son or daughter or maybe for their job. Like you didn't know that their job was going through turmoil and now you hear it in the prayer meeting and you're like, God, move it. That you can supplicate, you can intercess. And then something happens, like I said, I, I encourage you, with, if you can go in June to our harvesters in Amarillo, and just having, how many people are there? Maybe 100, 200 people in the prayer room in that rumble. You're all, we're all in one accord in that moment in time because we come together for service and we're praying to God. We're seeking God for the things that we need and for the church and for the fellowship. And that rumble, I believe, is the, as close as we can get to the day of Pentecost. Now, corporate is not the only importance because if you're only praying when we come together, then you're still falling short because then you also need private, just you and God. Prayer closet, a spot out in the park. Sometimes it's your car. <laughs> I know you get a way to, to eat your snacks that you don't want the kids eating in your car. Well, can you do the same thing to, to pray to God? Can you go off by yourself, set a time aside, and seek God with all your heart? See, that's where you do those private prayers. You shouldn't be praying about some of these personal stuff that you don't want nobody to hear about, and you're doing it over here in the church. Those are those private prayers. Those are where you get the nitty-gritty. 
Brother Dusty said it not too long ago. That's, that's our only communication with the heavenly spiritual Father. Prayer. That's our most intimate. Private is just you getting a hold of God. You seeking God. You desiring God. See, we need to learn to pray with every kind of prayer. Remember, this point was the fire for effect, military term of unloading everything. This is what we need if we want God to move in our churches. If we're seeking this end time revival, we need to fire for effect. We need to unload everything. Unload every barrel. One thing he even said, he files lawsuits in heaven. Too many people are focusing on suing each other here on earth. But can you file lawsuits in heaven, pleading the blood of Jesus upon situations? And oh, one of his quotes, this is going to bring encouragement and power to some of you guys. The devil trembles when the weakest saint gets on their knees. Do you hear that? The weakest saint, the devil trembles. Now they're connecting with God. Now they're getting strength. The devil is no match for a praying Christian. Do you hear me? I forgot to give you my title. If you're taking notes, the title of my sermon was Prayer, Power, Equipped. So if you really want to grow, you're going to lock in and tune into this prayer. And before I pull all to call, I'm going to go ahead and bring you the challenge. Since we're talking about prayer, and even the, the fire for effect, how many of you guys want God, want God to move in your life? How many of you guys want God to move in this church? How many of you guys want God to move in this city? And then I bring a challenge to you that we can see God move. If you guys would join in for the next 90 days, it's three months. So join with us in prayer before every service. Every service. During the week, I understand schedules and jobs. <clears throat> Most churches do it every day of the week, but I'm going to keep it at the three days a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, if you can join us in prayer in the morning at 7 o'clock. <clears throat> Fridays. It's on the calendar for the next three months. Fire for effect. This is what we're doing. See, this is even a challenge to me. Because one of the one of the one of my things is like, you know, I'll just I'll just I'll just pray at home because not too many people come. Sometimes nobody comes and it's just me and no, I need to come up here faithfully. And I like I said, once again, you're not gonna go to hell. You're not your salvation is not in trouble if you don't make it or if you miss a day. But we're just making a commitment and a challenge to connect with God. See, all this is a part is about the will of God, that we would conform to it because that's how we renew. That's how we transform. That's how we are restored. And if you accept this challenge, watch what God will do. And I guarantee we're going to have testimonies. We're going to have different things. I'm, I'm going to have a testimony service at the end of the three months so that we can talk about what God is doing, what he has done. 
And I know if you're, like, if you're a stay-at-home mom or, you know, just getting kids to school, like I said, I understand that. But then set time aside. If you can't do these three days at these times, set three days, set a certain time aside. If you can't come in here to the church, set it aside so that you're still partnering with us. See, that's still being in one accord. I challenge you guys to this. And I'm going to be doing the same thing. We should keep each other in accountability. Are you guys able to do that? Lift your hand. This is this, not to embarrass you, but you're just saying, I'm making this challenge. I'm making this covenant. Now, it's still between you and God because I'm not going to be micromanaging. I'm not going to be like, oh, you didn't do it. That's between you and God. So if I can have every head bowed and every eye closed, just for a few moments, hallelujah. See, this is one of the reasons why we need revivals. This is why we need conferences, because we need to be challenged. We need to be stirred. And God has already been dealing with me. You, if you've noticed and you look back on a lot of my preaching and stuff like that, I've been already touching on prayer and worship and different things like that. I'm, I'm honing into those things. Prayer is where it's at because this is how we even start. Initially, it's the prayer of salvation where we connect with God and realize that we need to submit to his authority. And maybe you're in this place, you're not saved, and you don't, know, you don't have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but you want to this morning. Won't you lift your hand saying, Pastor, that's me, I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. But I need to, I see my need this morning. Or maybe you're backslidden. Maybe at one point in time you were living for God, doing the things for God in church, maybe even ministry and different things like that. But decisions are maybe how most of us are is that we didn't get the answer to our prayer that we wanted. And it made us question things. And then we went back into a life of sin or separation from God. But this morning, you want to rededicate your life. Won't you lift your hand saying, Pastor, that's me. This is not to embarrass you. This just shows that you mean business. And we would love to pray with you. We're here to help you. Is there anybody backslidden, not right with God, or unsaved, never, never been saved in your life? Won't you lift your hand saying, Pastor, that's me. Hallelujah. Moving right along. Saints of God. Fire for effect. We need to get into the arena. If you've been a part of this church for any length of time and have not been a part of our prayer meeting or prayer before service, then I dare say, are you even in, are you even fighting? This is why so many times in my sermon I talked about them being in one accord, them being together. This does not work unless we're together. This does not work unless we're all moving in the same direction. One accord, fighting for the things of God, fighting for the will of God in our lives, in each other's lives, and in our city. As we sing this song, I'm going to open the altar. Maybe there's some things that you need to come before God. And yes, of course, it's in prayer. God, I need your help. The whole conference was talking about men of wisdom and having wisdom. You need wisdom in your life for guidance, direction. Come, seek it. The only way you get it is through asking. And you know what? He does say, God does say, I give it freely, but you must ask. This altar is open. Come, get a hold of God as we sing this song. Hallelujah. Rise. Giving up my pride. 
for the promise of new life. And I Watch what happens. You accepted the challenge, stick with it. Or maybe you even, you're kind of like, I don't know how I'm, I'm going to get this to work. Pray about it or even talk to me. You know, as I was thinking about it, you know, um, you know, Brother Joe being on the road Monday through Friday, for him to be a part, if you would just maybe set that timer at 7 o'clock in the morning as we come, to, he's on the road. But we're like-minded in one accord. He's praying at the same time as we are. He's a part of the challenge. He's a part of the church. Like I said, you can work it out. Just don't disregard and be like, well, I can't do it. No, you can be a part of this. And it's needed. That's We need everyone that is here to partake somehow. And this will thrust us forward. Because all of us, I believe we can all feel it. We're on the verge of a breakthrough, of an inflow. Of something. There's an expectancy. And it's coming. But we just need to go over that, get over that last hump, that last wall, whatever the case may be. And I believe this is what's going to do it. As we join together in prayer. Like I said, look at the calendar. Make a point to be a part. A prayer before service, prayer during the week, or monthly prayer at the end of the month for the next three months. Or should I say 90 days because I know we're off kilter now. It's 21st. But watch what God will do in your life, in this church, and in your city. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Stand behind it. Don't allow the devil to lie to you. Remember, remember I talked about angry prayer. You start seeing them come after you, 
be like, devil man, I'm going to give you a black eye. I'm going to kick you to kingdom come. And how we do that is through prayer. The devil don't like it. But we have power through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. That's all I have this morning. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Amen. Brother Andre, will you close us? Amen. Stick around. Fellowship. Amen. We got coffee tea in the back. Sitting here come my blessings uh, Ain't no need for stressing in my life My enemies see my form weapons Yeah But I know I'm protected by the blood Protected by the love of God Grace and mercy All his favor Keeps taking me higher Just like God's grave was And every time I turn around Shaking, this is all sinking. 
to keep me never to leave me he's never 